Let's give a warm welcome to Amber. So I wanted to give just a little bit of a presentation before I start my demo, um, because I feel like my work um, sometimes you can take for what it is, but I feel like the explanation makes it more interesting. So, and also for the students to talk, talk a little bit about how I came to make what I make and um, do what I do. Um, so everyone always asks how I started in glass, and you know, all of you have your story as well about what objects made when when you were a little kid um, you connected with. And for me, it was these pink elephant swizzle sticks in my parents' basement cabinet. Um, I found these when I was about seven years old and loved them and was obsessed with the idea of glass. So I went to undergrad at Salisbury University in Maryland and I graduated with my BFA in glass from there. The school was very small and I, I mostly just did um, hot shop work. Um, they didn't really have a flame working studio. Um, I bought a torch and set stuff up. I didn't know how to do anything for two years. Um, so I took my first class with Shane Farrow actually after graduating, um, after having flame work for a number of years on my own. Um, and after finishing at Salisbury, I moved to New York City and um, worked for a woman named Michiko Sakano. She owned a hot shop in, in Brooklyn. And um, I was mainly for, I lived in New York for about five years. I had a lot of different jobs, um, mainly as a hot shop assistant um, for Michiko and also for a number of other um, hot shop artists. I also designed and produced a men's cuff link line that for a company that had a very good production team, as you can see. Um, I bartended full time as well, um, had a lot of different jobs. So after living there for about five years, I decided I was either going to quit glass because um, I wasn't, didn't really have enough time to make my own work. Um, I was either going to quit glass and become a pastry chef or a real estate agent. Those were my choices. <laughs> and. I applied to two grad schools and luckily I got into one at Tyler. So um, some major technical influences on my, on my way, um, Shane Farrow, who I took my first real flame working class with, I think that was in about maybe 2004. Um, Paul Stankard, who has been an, um, an influence on me for a long time and had the opportunity to be one of his um, workers for a while after grad school. Kari Russell Poole, um, Lucio Bubaco, and Gianni Toso has been um, a major mentor and influence. I've TA'd for him many times and from these people I've adopted um, my own working style. Um, I make, I work soft glass. I know how to do borosilicate um, and when I teach classes and things like that I do teach it but what I'm going to show you today is how I make my, my parts, things like that. So, so my technical influences have all been glass, and I love glass. But um, my artistic influences have always been sculpture, um, and mainly um, female sculptors, um, particularly Ava Hess, um, Tara Donovan, Agnes Martin, who's actually a painter, Petta Coyne. Um, this is, where's Waldo? You can see. And some childhood influences here. Um, this piece was actually shown last night, and this is the mechanical theater, theater at Corning. I've probably TA'd and taught um, a dozen classes at Corning, and the museum is a huge influence to me, particularly these Nevere uh, figures and the um, theaters and things like that, the Bone Church in Rome. So I went to, to grad school at Tyler and was trying to figure out my way there and figure out my work. I really, for a long time, didn't have the opportunity to make my own sculpture. I was just working so much for other people. Um, so this was the first piece where I kind of felt like I actually found my own. Um, 
And this piece is called A Revelation of a Circuit. It's about um, the Egyptian goddess that brings you through to the afterlife. And this piece is actually, um, if you look at it up close, has legs and scorpions and all kinds of things pulling you into this. It, when it gets installed, a big hole gets cut in the wall, and so the, the, it's an illusion where the piece actually goes back behind the wall. Um, this piece was, I feel like, where my technical and conceptual and all that kind of first came together. Um, when I was in school, I was literally running out of money, and um, I was buying so much glass. That first piece I just showed you was um, all made from effetre, um, which is cheaper than borosilicate color, but it's still quite expensive, you know, because I'm trying, I wanted to make bigger and bigger sculpture. Um, so one day behind the furnaces at Tyler, I found this barrel of glass that was this really pretty pink color, and I dumped it out. And what I found in the barrel was all these broken parts was it was actually a barrel of old Easter candy dishes that after some research had found that it came from a glass factory in West Virginia called Fenton. So I decided to um, try to use the glass and it actually worked in the flame just like the glass that I was using but it was 100 pounds and it was free and it was beautiful color. So. Um, you know, once I realized this, um, I made this piece, and you can still see some of the rabbits and chickens in there and things like that. Um, once I realized this, I was like, well, if I can use this glass, why can't I use anything? And, you know, it's one of those times when you realize maybe you were trapped inside this room, but you didn't realize it. Um, so I started really, um, using all kinds of different glass and thinking about um, the history of the material and what is available around me. You know, I think that a lot of times innovation and revelation in artwork comes when you run out of what's accessible and you just realize what's abundant. Um, so this piece was actually made um, with all old milk glass pieces. Um, and the interesting thing I was finding is when I was starting to do research on the factory that I was getting the material from, I found that I could actually start dating the glass. This piece, um, if you see in the bottom right hand corner, there's like a stamp. So this particular barrel came from Fenton and at the factory, each of the gaffers would, be, would have a signature stamp called a basket handler stamp. So you know when they would use to make the, the glass baskets and at the ends, right here, they would stamp it. So those stamps were actually signatures for each of the gaffers. So what I found was that if I was rummaging through a barrel and found two different stamps, I could then essentially date the glass because of, um, on the website, they had a listing of all the stamps and the names of the men. So this was um, at my BFA show, and then um, I had my first big exhibition at Heller Gallery in New York in 2012. Um, a lot of my work, you know, I kind of teeters between maybe looking really beautiful, and then when you get closer, it's kind of scary or um, intimidating, things like that. Doug Heller said that this piece scared the crap out of people because these are actually really long spikes. Um, so after I started um, using this glass, people got the word and um, would just start sending me stuff or bringing me stuff. Um, is Nancy here? No? Um, so Nancy was a student here. Um, some of you might know her. She was my student when I taught here. And um, she used to bring me glass and started me on a series, which I'll talk about it in a minute. But um, it's funny that now that people hear about my work, I get a box like once every couple months from someone that I've never even met um, from across the country that's like, has some broken piece in it or broken uh, parts in it. They're like, can you use this? 
and sometimes I usually do. Um, so these pieces were made in the hot shop. Um, I call them the reincarnate to record series, thinking about how the glass is kind of, or this particular press glassware really isn't being made anymore. Um, but it was a major industry in our in our country that helped build um, build jobs and things like that. This piece was made out of um, two milk glass hobnail lampshades. And um, this piece is called Peach Blow Away. Um, this color was actually a really popular color in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, it was so popular at one point that a town in Colorado was named Peach Blow Colorado. Um, women's fashions, cocktails, all this stuff were named after this particular color of glass. Now, if you Google Peach Flow, this piece actually comes up, um, at least on my Google. You never know, tricky. Um, so this piece I called Avon Goes Goth because um, these pieces were actually sold through Avon and originally made at the Wheaton Glass Factory in New Jersey. But I just think it's so funny to think about the Avon ladies like trying to hawk this really dark goth glass. Um, this was actually a bubble bath decanter. Um, one of the downfalls of working with some of the stuff I do is that I have to clean out like 50 year old perfume or bubble bath. It's real nasty, yeah. So this was the original um, advertisement for that type of glass. The candlestick holders you actually unscrewed and there was a little perfume spritz in the... Um. So I had an opportunity to do a residency um, in Australia and you know when I first wrote for the fellowship I thought well I'll use press glass like we have here. Well Australia does not have that. Um, they never had that industry which I didn't realize. So, and I was living on a college campus, so the only thing that was abundant and available to me was beer and wine bottles. So that's what I used. Um, and they have a really big history of fusing because of the artist Klaus Moye. So um, I started doing a lot of large scale um, fusings there. And this piece was actually at the Philadelphia airport for a while. And um, I have one of the best compliments from my work and kind of that I think tapped into the feeling of maybe what I'm trying to get with my work. I got an email from a man, it was like three lines long. Um, he saw the, the green pieces at the bottom and he said, um, I saw this case and I started crying because I thought of a memory I hadn't thought of in 40 years of my grandparents serving me ice cream sundaes in those dishes. And I think that, you know, that's kind of something that I'm trying to maybe evoke in my work as far as tapping into a memory of an object and um, maybe how objects that you forget about can cause a really visceral, visceral reaction or uh, memory that maybe you forgot. So when I got back from Australia, I really wanted to use American glass. And um, Nancy, who was a student here, um, brought me in one day this whole set of these white dishes. Actually, this is, um, this is one of them. And all this stuff was made out of this glass. And Nancy brought me in a, probably 10 plates and 10 cups from this. She was a farmer, and um, the farm had been passed down for generations, and all the housewives would buy a set of dishes, and then the next wife would put it in the barn. So she brought me all these, and um, I tried to use it, and I loved the color. Um, I found out that this glass was actually um, an item that you could purchase through the redemption of SNH green stamps. So, Maybe some of the younger people might not know what this is, but um, when you used to go to the grocery store or buy gas, things like that, there was a machine that printed out these stamps. You put them in the booklets and then you took them to the store to buy items. Um, you could buy glass, housewares, things like that. 
So this particular line of glass, which is called the Colony Harvest Pattern from the Indiana Glass Factory, was an, an item that you could purchase through these stamps. It's kind of like um, airline points now. So. Um, so a lot, this, Nancy really started this series that I've still been working on, and that was probably about six years ago. Um, I just love this color. Um, it's really abundant in thrift stores, places where I go to get my glass on eBay. Um, and so these are some pieces I've made through that. This is a large bowl, flame worked and fused. And these are actually made in the hot shop. So um, they're large compotes, they're called wedding compotes. So I will flame work the parts. And then um, I, I have the compote hot and I pick it up on a punty and then have another kiln with all my parts and then put everything together. If I had more time, I would have done that demo um, today as well. It's a pretty cool demo. Um, this piece is called Rosette in Milk and Ivory and I walked into the Philadelphia Museum of Art one day and looked up at the ceiling and I thought that one of my pieces was on the ceiling um, which was actually a plaster ceiling rosette. Um, so that's what this piece was based off of. Um, this is where I go to buy my glass. It's a collet yard in West Virginia. Um, Fenton has gone out of business um, and, but they, there is a collet yard in the same town that um, has, was supplied by their glass. The interesting thing about this particular collet yard was that in the beginning of the student, studio glass movement, so in the 1960s, late 60s and early 70s, now in the furnaces here we use glass such as spruce pine, system 96, things like that glass that is made for artists. Back then, there was no glass that was made for artists. Um, so what the glass blowers would do, would buy, would, they would buy cullet from factories and blow glass with that. Um, so once the glass, once new clean clear melt artistic glass ca came around, they forgot about this place. Um, so, but the interesting thing is, is that you know, so basically what the cullet yard is, is when they would do a run of production at the factory, all the broken scraps, all the pieces would get thrown into a pile and then that would get sold. Um, they sell this glass now um, to marble factories, maybe in, in Mexico. They also market it as um, landscaping glass. I don't know who would put this in their yard, but... Um, so what I generally do is go to the yard, um, find a color that I like, and do research on the color. This color is called chocolate. This is my friend gathering it. This is some pieces that it was originally made, that would, what it would look like originally. And this is a piece that I made out of it. Um, I usually try to incorporate original parts. There's a plate in here from 1976, which was a run they did of this uh, glass for a centennial plate. There's an eagle plate in there. Um, I also find little treasures in the glass, such as cat heads, bears, all kinds of other things. Um, I made a large installation um, based on the Morgan base, which is um, this piece here that sold at auction in 1886 for $18,000 to a man named William Walters, who owned the Walters Art Museum. Short side of the story is he denied the purchase because he was embarrassed, which set off a um, war between the New York Times and the Baltimore Sun, and then essentially created this fad, like what I talked about earlier with the peach blow. So it created maybe, maybe the only time in history that a glass color created a fad across the whole country that ended up becoming um, things like the town named Peach Blow, Colorado, things like that. So a lot of glass factories and ceramic factories made glass in replicate of that. And this is a piece I made. Um, this piece is called White Swan Theater. The whole edge of this piece is actually these um, dishes. 
Um, and the swans are from the Philly AIDS Thrift, the greatest thrift store in Philly, if you're over there. This piece is um, called The Lion and the Fox, and the, the lion and the fox heads are actually both original candy dish lids. Um, I try to find out when the molds are from that I use, um, but the, the problem is a little bit is that sometimes the mold could maybe be from the 1800s, but then that factory might have closed, it gets sold, get passed, gets passed down from factory to factory. So I'm not exactly sure ex when um, a lot of the pieces that I use are made. Some of them could be from the late 1800s, some of them up until, two, until the early 2000s. The eyes are original and I think that they're really creepy, but I decided to keep them on. Um, I also think of my, my work in kind of two different ways, in stories and then also kind of like uh, paintings. Um, this piece is called Gray 80. It's the exact height of me, and it's used a whole 80-pound um, barrel of gray. Um, I found out in 2014 that I got um, the Raquel Commission from the Corning Museum of Glass, and um, I had been saving a lot of glass for that. Well, not for that, um, but I never thought I would get that. But um, I'd been saving a lot of glass, special items, and so I decided to use them. All of, the, all of these pieces, except for the cat, made it in the piece. It's a little hard to see, but if you go to Corning, um, this piece is in the new wing. Um, it's called the Garden of the Forgotten and Extinct, and it has um, seven, seven different animals um, all living in their little world forever. This is called Burmese Dream. So a lot of times I'll just be making parts and then not really know exactly what the piece is gonna end up being and then I'll find the perfect, um, maybe like the butterfly for example. I didn't, I wasn't finalized on this piece until I found that butterfly and I found it in an antique store. So that's kind of how I work is um, a lot of it is through chance um, and thrift store shopping, eBay purchasing, friends finding stuff for me um, to find me like that special part that really like makes a piece pop. Um, this is called River Green and Mint. One of the kind of sad things about my work is that um, the mint green in this piece, for example, as I might have used the last barrel of this. I'm still looking for more, but I really can't find it. Um, so, you know, this piece might be the last time that this particular color is shown. Um, and I've been, I've been doing some more like um, quicker sketch, I call them sketches in my head. Um, just using the glass and using kilns to kind of manipulate the glass. I have a show coming up at the Fuller Craft Museum in, in Massachusetts, and I have a really big space to fill. If I was going to fill it with all of my work, like the really detailed stuff, it would take me five years. So um, I'm trying to just get a little bit um, quicker with my process. Um, a lot of my friends, artist friends, do sketches, and they have like a daily sketch that they do. My work is so much slower than that that I needed to find something that was really um, a quick interpretation of my ideas. And this is kind of what I've been working on now. So I'm going to make a big wall installation of all these manipulated old forms. That's my bunny walrus. Sometimes they just come out really, you know. And I'm also working on a new project um, where I'm trying to start basically a 3D scan library of these old pieces. So um, that hand, for example, was an old jewelry dish or a soap dish. Um, and what I'm doing is getting 3D scans of these pieces and I had this graphite mil mold milled for me so that then I can start doing um, multiples and um, larger scale installations using um, 
many of the same part. Um, so I'm hoping to start this library so we can get, um, you know, a library of these scans so then other artists can maybe use them. You can scale it up, you can scale it down. So maybe a caster would want to um, make a really large scale hand like this or maybe someone would, would want to use like that great pattern. So then once the 3D scan, li scan is established or the library is established, then you can take or leave information, take parts of information. So I'm applying for some grants and things like that to do that. This so is my newest piece. Um, it's called Creamer and Sugar Swans in the Sky. And um, there's an Avon bubble bath top that's kind of flowing out of a bunch of bubbles. And there's a, um, an original swan creamer and sugar in the That's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so let me explain my process a little bit. Um, so the glass that I use, I don't know what COE it is. Um, so in general, I don't mix my colors. Um, there is a way to test compatibility with different kinds of glasses in the stringer test. Has anyone ever done that? Stringer test? Couple of people. So maybe if I have time, I'll show you how to do that. Um, but in general, I believe that the glass I use is in the 90s, 80s or 90s. That being said, um, I kind of know now when I look at a color how it's going to work. Sometimes I'm wrong, but I can kind of tell now. So for example, um, the whites that I use, the more um, the more like whole milk kind of color of white, that's a lot softer um, than, do you know, like if it would look like skim milk, that kind of milk glass, that's really stiff glass. I actually hate working with that stuff. Um, so what I do is um, I actually use boar silk at punties um, and I bring my my, I, what I do in the, when I come in in the morning, I have a kiln actually right here, it's a Paragon. It's a little one of those blue ones, small, like guillotine door blue ones. And I put all my glass chunks in there um, in the front. Um, and I bring it up to about 10.30, um, let it heat up. Let's say I'm working and I do all my parts and they go in um, and, I, and I ran out of glass. I just like throw some more in when it's hot because if it breaks, I don't really care. I just make a smaller piece. Um, so, yeah. Quick question. Do you have anything in your kiln floor to avoid the kiln dust? Do you dust it off when it comes out? Yeah, so I, uh, I actually, so my friend gave me these little strips of like uh, Kevlar, like it's like a s cloth. I put them on that. But um, I wash all the glass first if it's broken. And then, um, yeah, I'll, I'll dust it off. If there's dust, I dust it off with like a paper, wet paper towel. Um, so. Am I the only one that still uses a Carlisle in here or what? No, I like, I like a Carlisle. So basically, I'm just gonna like go through a bunch of the different pieces that I make. Um, I use these hemostats to grab the glass out. The door's heavy.
So kind of my process is I like to make big sculptures. So I try to make the nicest, fastest pieces possible. This is kind of a new one I like. It's like a, I think it kind of looks like iron, like a coiled iron. So obviously the bore silicate is not compatible. So I need to take that, take that all off. Okay. Uh, hold on a second, it's kind of a big piece. I think that this that this particular piece of green I'm using right now is like the it might have been like the top of a lampshade or something that because I have like a whole barrel of this weird shape. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> The other thing that working this way brought to me was that, so a lot of the pieces that I make are pretty, I want to say large comparably, but imagine trying to melt down rods of glass to make a chunk that big, right? It would take a really long time and you would need probably like maybe what, four or five rods and that's really annoying to do. Have you guys ever tried to do that? Like wad up like four or five rods to make a big part. It takes forever. Um, so this method that I've, you know, I don't know if this method would really work for anyone else, but it works for me. So that's what I've just developed as far as how I make, how I make my stuff. And, you know, I feel like there's so much innovation with flame working right now that, um, it's really cool to see all that stuff, but you gotta just do what works for you.
I'm not talking because I'm nervous right now. Ugh. I do this like 50 hours a week, of course. What's that? Oh, thank you. I call this feathers. <laughs> What's that? No, it's like only when I get only when I get really far along with a piece do I need specific things. Um, but generally, how I work is that I just I make parts for months and months and months, and I just build up this big stock of pieces. And you know, I know you're gonna ask how I make, how I put them together. It's a couple different ways. Um, so sometimes they are fused, um, like in the bowls and things like that. And um, sometimes with the larger pieces, they're constructed. So what I do is put a piece of wire in the back. So Eric was talking about wire last night, and I actually use it too. Um, I use, I actually use a nichrome wire, so like a kiln element wire, and um, and then I do constructing, so it's like a flower arranging. Um, I have a carpenter that makes me frames to my liking. Um, So what I do is I use basically a, a, a basic soft glass annealing program for like a hot chop kind of, well not as quite as long, but um, since my glass is sitting at, generally sitting at 1030 all day, I bring it down to 960 and I hold for an hour. And then I um, bring down, after, after the hold, I'll bring it down for like, like 200 degrees an hour. Um, Until it's cool. It's fine. I'm not like super, I've never been one for super technical stuff. Um, I guess we're all technical in our own ways, but if the glass doesn't break for me, it's fine. It works. Yeah, so how I work is one piece, one piece goes in and one piece comes out. It's like that all day. So I just basically, I crank, crank the part, parts all day long. Um, the other thing is you can pull this into cane. So I think I might have done this demo here a couple years ago. Um, and it was kind of cool because this lady, a, a bead maker came up and said, a few years later said, you know, I don't, I don't, spend any money on seed beads now, I just use bottles. All the stuff that I'm, use, that I'm doing today, you can do with wine bottle glass. The same thing, or beer bottles, or whatever. You know, you don't just, you just don't want to use glass that's going to have, like, paint on it, or that nasty, like, coating or whatever, like the spray coating, stuff like that. So I'm just going to pull this, and I'll show you guys how, well, you're not going to be able to really see, but how to do a solo pull. Do this, then you pop it down in between your shoes. You're alone. That pull. This is when you're by yourself in your studio. But then this is the tricky part. Then what do you do with it? Then you gotta. Then you gotta do this. Oh. Okay. Well, sometimes that happens. But now you got all that material to make tiny pieces. Um, or sometimes what I'll do is just take this extra part. Make something out of that. No. 
blue. Sometimes even just changing the color gets me less bored. Any other questions? I can't hear. Is there any way we could get a microphone in the audio? Oh, um, when I pull the piece out, is that when I decide that what I'm gonna make? No, it's kind of more like when I make that ball and if it's like longer, or like that gather, if it's a little bit longer, I'll make one of the more stretch shapes or if it's more compact, I'll make a more compact shape. I don't know. If I get on, like if, if one day I'm like really into making these flowers or something, I just go for it. Um, but usually I just like to switch it up a lot. This is like the, f I don't know if I invented this flower, but I like to think that I did. It's like the fastest flower you can make. This blue is a little bit stiffer than the green.
some something sorry I'm still having trouble hearing you yeah No, I like to, um, hold on one sec. I definitely like to keep, keep some original parts in there. Um, I wish I had more and, and that's because I might get it, I might get a 150 pound barrel, but I only find like three little bears in it, you know? So I try to use those, but you know, they could get lost. So that's, that's kind of why I'm starting to do the replicate of the molds is because um, I want more of that original stuff in there, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not that easy to find. Um, and a lot of it's just broken, so. I use that tool a lot to kind of just like mash it into like a, a shape that's more usable. Um, just to get it a little bit more compact before I add the other punty. Why do I use two punties? Uh, because you can just use one and try to melt it down that way, but it takes a lot longer. Like, as you can see, the majority of what I do is basically just melting a chunk into a gather. And with using two punties, I can really like, I push one hand forward and one hand back. And um, I can get that gather into a usable ball really fast. So you saw that went from a chunk to a usable ball in what like 10 seconds and you know the cool thing about that is like how long would it take to melt down rod enough to get to it would take forever right i'm gonna make a thorny vine this but you could also um this has little ridges but you could also you know those little plates that have the um ridges plates you can use one of those too and i just use a lot of bonsai shears um get Amy LaMare to do a demo.
Yeah, buddy. Now you got the hang of it. There it is. That was a big one. What do I make with this one? So this is a little trick is that I always, um, before I start again, you may think, oh, well, there's, there's already some glass on there. Why don't I just use that? It just never works right because that glass has been sitting there and cooling. And when you start to work, a lot of times you'll get a, it'll just fall. So I always quench and knock off my little punty um, and start fresh. I go through a box of boro like rod like every like four months or something, you know. And this actually using the boro rod as punties with soft glass is something that I learned from Lauren Stump. Um, he, when he pulls his Marini, if you guys I'm sure probably other people in here have taken a class from him. Yeah? Um, he, he pulls all of his uh, Marini, soft glass Marini with four socket punties. in here. I'm not used to this quiet when I'm working. Is that a question? Um, I use 18. Okay, so I've been doing this but not explaining it, is that a lot of times if I want to punty something, um, I leave a little bit of that extra glass on this side, and then while it's still hot, I marver it, and make that little punty, and then I sit it over here, um, so that I have it for when I want to punty it, but you have to heat that back up and melt it back in and marver it again. Otherwise, it that's cooling down right now. Um, so otherwise it might, when you go to punny it, you're like, oh cool, and then you like go to take it off this rod and the whole thing falls on the table. So you definitely have to um, heat that up again.
So I'm gonna make a rose out of this chunk. So I start with the center, make a twist, pinch and twist. I'm using it like the side of my tweezers. So you definitely don't want those like ridges. I hate those tweezers with the ridges on the inside. I turn down my torch because I'm basically just spot heating um, the area where I'm gonna pinch the pedal. I pinch and then I kind of pull around. And then you want to give a little bit of like a heat and tuck. You really need a cup of water here because your tweezers are going to get super hot and they're going to stick. So after every one of these I do, So now I go around, so the, the pedal that I'm going to start from where the middle of the last two was. That was bad. The other thing is if you're working on something bigger like this, you really need to keep that, um, the joint between the boro and the soft goss hot because that is definitely an area where it will crack off and then your whole thing's just gonna fall on the table. Um, so you really need to keep that hot so it, so it doesn't crack. And then occasionally, um, you know, just heat the whole thing a little bit. Colton. 
I think I may, I probably will do the, the teacup, but I forgot to get a punty. Okay. So I'll want like, like a, like a rod, like a, like yeah. Can you show me how? Is that how long is that? Like, uh, like that. I have to say, I worked for so long without this, and I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> My God, I was crazy. The lovely Griffin glass. My shop mate. I mean, I occasionally run into it, but it's worth saving my face all the time. I'm gonna put the wire in this one so you guys can see. So I grabbed the punny again, and I need to heat it up. Like right now, I just heard a ting. So I don't wanna go ahead and, and use that as a punky. So I'm gonna, I have to heat this whole thing up, get it really, even the boro really nice and hot. Make it into a punty again. Keep that hot. I use these little mini ones. I used to be secretive about that, but now I don't care.
you. You know, the glass world has like this, this thing, in a way I think that they need to get over a little bit about not using other materials as well. There, people in gla with glass are just so glass all the time. And I think that um, it limits you. You know, I think that, um, and no one else cares other than us, right? <laughs> like in the real, like in the world of art and fine art and sculpture, no one cares what materials you use, right? Um, and I love glass. I'm very much a glass person. You know, I'm a glass professor. I teach Tyler now. Um, but, and I don't, you know, like, I think that you should use whatever glass and whatever materials work with your idea. You know, like, sometimes borosilicate's the only way to work with a certain idea that I might have, you know? Not too much anymore, but I've made a lot of pieces with boro because that's the material that, I think that especially, especially with flame working, there's only a few ways to go big, make really big sculptures, right? You do networking, you make a lot of different parts and you assemble them some way, or you use other materials to put them together, right? Um, what other ways can you make big sculpture with flame working? I don't know, it's a good question. My two favorite ladies in the front. Salem's own <laughs> Kathy Teriyaki. <laughs> My bench neighbor, Hallie. <laughs> but actually, uh, some of my pieces, for example, like the, um, the swan theater piece, the white piece with the two swans in it, that whole frame is fused. Um, and, and what I do is actually, sometimes if I want to do a really big piece and it's all fusing, I'll do fused sections. So instead of having to make like this like four foot fused thing that's very sketchy to move around and all that, I'll do it in one foot sections and then um, I make pieces and I'll place them over the seam line um, so that it looks like a four foot section but really it's a one foot section. Does that make sense? I'm going to make a ribbon. What do you need to make this time? A ribbon. my greatest in Australia I just did a thing at the conference and that was everyone's favorite too 
Those are fun. Okay, so now I'm going to attempt a demo that I don't normally do, but I figure it's the conference and I should do something special. Um, but <laughs> I feel like maybe I make so, so many of these pieces that it gets, actually I didn't make this one. So what I'm gonna do is I have a, um, a full teacup in the kiln and I have um, a bunch of parts already made that are hot in the kiln, okay? So I'm going to um, use this larger punty and pick up the teacup and basically um, cut it apart and assemble the pieces onto it. Um, and then I'll put it back in the kiln. But so it'll look like those reconstructed pieces. Normally I would make these in the hot shop, okay? But you can make them, it's tricky, it's tricky. And honestly, if I have two in there um, because there is a possibility that right when I pick it up and put it in here, the whole thing's gonna crack. Because remember, it is soft glass, um, so. So I'm gonna add a little bit of this white material to the punty. All right, buddy. So I actually turned the kiln up to 1050 when I did that, just in case. Okay.
thorny vine. Woo! Am I winging? Yeah, totally. I don't think it really looks good if, you, if I try to pre-plan it too much. But that's kind of how I make all my, when I assemble, when I do the pieces in the hot shop. Um, I mean, I have, like, I usually always put, like, one pearl on one of these, or, like, I, I'm into these, like, thorny vines right now. Um, but, no, I, I kind of just, and putting stuff on. put one pearl and then I'm gonna maybe be done. This gets heavy. So I'm probably just going to put this whole thing with the punty right back in the kiln and hopefully the punty will just, because I added that little bit, will just pop right off. Oh, look at that. Okay. Ooh. Okay. 